Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, it is certainly a delight uh, to be here with you in this beautiful building designed by uh, Stanford White uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. And before we uh, go further, uh, I'd like you to be able to meet and recognize uh, some key members of uh, our leadership team. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Dr. Prabhat Hajela, uh, our provost, and, and Professor of Aerospace Engineering. Of course, you just met Mr. Greg Easton, who is our Vice President for Institute Advancement. Uh, Mr. Claude Rounds, who is our Vice President for Administration. Uh, a person I'll introduce more completely uh, shortly, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Uh, Jonathan Dordick, our Vice President for Research. Uh, our special guest, uh, Dr. Dennis Charney, who is uh, Dean of the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. I will be introducing him more fully later as well. Uh, we have, have Mr. James Spencer, I think James is still here, who is our uh, Executive Director of Real Estate and New Ventures. Now his title is actually longer than that, but we, don't, we just have this evening. Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce Ms. Alicia Mazursky, who is uh, Chief of Staff. Uh, also, our wonderful uh, IA staff, uh, especially those in alumni relations, uh, led by uh, Mr. Jeff Shantz, who is our uh, Executive Director of Alumni Relations. And then we have uh, some of our students here tonight, our red and white students, and, and I'd like to just recognize them as well. And if they're here, please stand. Now, I spoke of this wonderful place designed uh, by Stanford White at the beginning of the 20th century. But this evening, we're here to discuss the 21st century and the future of healthcare in the United States and, and indeed around the globe. Now, as Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute uh, approaches the 200th, doesn't that sound good? The 200th anniversary of our founding in 2024, uh, three factors have changed and, we believe, clarified our mission to apply science to the common purposes of life. First is the fact that the challenges we face are increasingly complex, interconnected, and global, including issues surrounding our food, water, and energy supplies, human health, and the mitigation of disease, a changing climate, climate and the allocation and, frankly, the geopolitics of scarce nat natural resources. The second great factor defining this moment is the consequent need to educate our young people and to educate them to be ready to collaborate across disciplinary and geographical borders, building on a, a grounding in the fundamentals, and therefore to be able to combine technical proficiency with intellectual agility. The third factor is the ubiquity of technologies that magnify the power of the individual and that connect us in new ways. An example, the avalanche of data generated by social media, uh, by low-cost genome sequencing, and by the Internet of Things with its smartphones, instrumented running shoes, automobiles, and biomedical devices all offer us the raw materials for a, a new understanding of the world. In fact, data can be considered as a great new natural resource. As with any resource, however, it is up to us to find ways to use it wisely. And so this is a watershed moment where our challenges and our opportunities are so great that they cannot be addressed by even the most brilliant person working alone nor by a single discipline, institution, sector, or nation. So what is required is what we call the new polytechnic, a new paradigm for teaching, learning, and research, which is the technological research university re-envisioned as a fresh collaborative endeavor 
across disciplines, sectors, and, and global regions. Now, such a university leads by using advanced technologies to unite a multiplicity of disciplines and perspectives in order to take on large, multifaceted challenges. So guided by the original Rensselaer Plan, and now the Rensselaer Plan 2024, Rensselaer is being transformed into the new Polytechnic. Now one outcome of what we have achieved in this regard is the affiliation beginning slightly less than two years ago of Rensselaer, a world-class technological research university without a medical school, and the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, a world-class medical school without a technological research university. And that is why we are so very pleased to have Dr. Dennis Charney, the Dean of the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai with us this evening. Ultimately, Mount Sinai and Rensselaer will do together what neither one could do alone, to realize the full promise of regenerative medicine, to develop new therapeutics based on a molecular understanding of disease, to make the goal of personalized medicine a reality, to develop advanced medical devices and imaging tools, to use advanced cognitive <coughs> and computing and immersive systems to improve decision making in medicine, and importantly, to educate physicians, scientists, and engineers who will make our future. Now, our partnership has been inspired in part by other successful models of cross-institutional collaboration, such as the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard which is helping to establish and exploit the molecular basis of many diseases. Our partnership also is the result of intelligent investments made over the last 15 years at Rensselaer in biotechnology and the life sciences with concomitant investments in world-class platforms such as the Center for Biotechnology and Interdisciplinary Studies and in our remarkable computational ecosystem. Of course, our most important investments have been in people, especially in our faculty and our students. Now, at my inaugural ceremony back in 1999, it's going further back, I was a lot younger then, I posed a few what I thought were fundamental questions to help the entire Rensselaer community to think about ways to move the institute to the forefront of the world's greatest technological universities. So I ask that we consider the core strengths that Rensselaer could build upon in research. I also ask that we consider this. Are there areas that are so vital that we must create a presence in them in order to stand at the forefront of world-class universities? So we put an early stake in the ground in an arena in which Rensselaer was relatively unknown, but one that held such promise for humanity that we were compelled to address it, and that is biotechnology. Now both healthcare and agriculture, interestingly enough, already were being revolutionized by advances in the life sciences and bioengineering. So Rensselaer could not afford to miss the moment when looming large were new opportunities to develop more effective therapeutics and tools of diagnosis, to regenerate and even to engineer tissues, and to improve industrial processes and products using the tools and methods designed by that cleverest of all engineers, nature. Now, admittedly, and I say this deliberately, to an alumni group. Admittedly, there were people at Rensselaer and of Rensselaer who were worried at the time that in aspiring to influence within a new sphere, we might stretch ourselves too thin and harm our traditional strengths. However, biology itself was being transformed 
as the visualization and manipulation of individual <coughs> molecules. And indeed, the genome became increasingly important. And as the life sciences focused more and more on phenomena that could, in fact, be mathematically described and drew on an understanding of systems, on computation, and on data and design-driven research. In fact, you may not know, in fact, that the Broad Institute is, in fact, headed by a mathematician. Now, it was not so much, and this is the key point, that Rensselaer was moving into biotechnology as that biotechnology was moving towards Rensselaer, towards our history, our mission, our strengths, our ambitions for the future. The Rensselaer Board of Trustees, and one of our trustees is here tonight, and I want you to meet him, uh, Howard Blitman. Howard, where are you? Please stand and be recognized. <laughs> the Rensselaer Board of Trustees embraced this vision. And the Rensselaer Prime, in, approved in May of 2000, promised that we would make dramatic investments in biotechnology. And those investments included over $100 million to build and to equip the Center for Biotechnology and Interdisciplinary Studies, or CEPIS as we call it, one of the world's most advanced centers for biotechnology and life science research, a dynamic and productive crossroads that brings together biologists, biochemical and biomedical engineers, chemists, and material scientists, physicists, architects, believe it or not, and many other experts across the disciplines. As we had hoped, CEPIS has expanded and revitalized the research enterprise and our academic offerings at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And since 2000, Rensselaer research expenditures funded by the National Institutes of Health have increased nearly 14-fold. Now, this research funding anchors overall sponsored research growth at Rensselaer from about 35 million per year in 2000 to approximately 100 million per year today. Now, I'm well aware that many of you in this audience, many of our alums, I mean, are undergraduate alums. So why am I spending the time talking to you about it? Well, talk to so many young people who are here, because they're the ones who are really engaged and engaged in our research enterprise and it is part of our teaching and learning. And in fact, the 40 resident faculty at the Biotech Center and their students have published more than 2,000 peer-reviewed papers in subject areas that include protein synthesis and manufacturing, regenerative medicine, biomaterials, and bioinformatics. The work has been cited in the scientific literature, and that's the real measure, nearly 30,000 but importantly, it has resulted in new classes of therapeutics to address threats to human health that include Alzheimer's, osteoporosis, antibiotic-resistant bacteria, diabetes, and spinal cord injury, and neurodegenerative diseases. Now, it is important to note that many of the investigations and discoveries arising within CEPIS and indeed in the field of biomedicine as a whole require sophisticated digital tools that are contributing to an explosion of medical data begging for interpretation. The genomics revolution alone is generating a staggering amount of data. There also is a tremendous challenge of integrating the data so that it can be interpreted, interpreted including patient records from myriad disparate systems and in integrating as well genomic information, increasingly lifestyle information, streaming data from medical devices, information even about our microbiomes or the microbes that have colonized us. You know, we're all like little coral reefs as far as <laughs> the microbial world is concerned. And, and these are increasingly implicated in health and disease. 
So 10 years ago, we invested in the Center for Biotechnology and Interdisciplinary Studies. Today, our focus on improving human health is one of the significant reasons that we are investing in what we call the Rensselaer IDEA, or the Institute for Data Exploration and Applications. And the Rensselaer IDEA brings together our strengths in web science, high performance in cognitive computing, data science and predictive analytics, and immersive technologies, and importantly links them to applications at the interface of engineering data-driven engineering design, as well as the physical life and social sciences. The tools we use include the most powerful supercomputer at an American private university today, a Petascale, IBM, you know I'm the president, I gotta talk about these things. <laughs> An I Petascale IBM Blue Gene Q system, which is stands which we call and is an advanced micro multiprocessing optimized system whose acronym, AMOS, harkens back to, thank you so much, our co-founder, Amos Eaton. And Amos is able to perform more than a quadrillion floating point operations or mathematical calculations per second. I don't have to tell this group what a quadrillion is. Now, but supercomputers like Amos are particularly well suited to modeling very large or very intricate systems. And so we have researchers who are doing important work in protein folding, determining how out of trillions of possibilities, a chain of amino acids encoded by our genes folds itself to determine a shape that determines its function. Now, misfolded proteins are actually implicated in a number of diseases such as Alzheimer's. But not every problem in medicine takes such a form. In fact, the answers to a great question often it requires finding the single valuable insight within an unruly flood of non-mathematical data. And therefore, we focus increasingly on what we call cognitive computing, or computing by more intelligent machines, able to make inferences from data and to teach themselves and add to our capabilities in new ways. And so again, you may be familiar with the IBM cognitive computing system, Watson, which in 2011 you beat the best human champions in jeopardy. And that's because Watson's able to absorb enormous amounts of natural language data, such as 2.5 million scientific, technical, and medical papers published every year in peer-reviewed English language journals, a flood of information which no human doctor can keep up. But Watson can find correlations, very valuable correlations within that data and generate hypotheses from it to drive further human exploration and experimentation. Now, we're very proud that many of the key figures in the development of Watson, in fact, are Rensselaer alumni and that we were the first university worldwide to receive a Watson computer for that kind of work. But now our scientists are working to expand cognitive computing to the entire wor world of open data on the web to make these intelligent systems even more nuanced. We're also investigating at Rensselaer neuromorphic computing, or computing that mimics the architecture and function of the human brain, including the ability to gain some of the brain's advantages. You know, so, and as well as the ability to learn through our senses as well as through our reason. You know, neuromorphic processors that mimic neurons and synapses are much more adept at analyzing sensory data than conventional processors. The potential applications in medicine are enormous, including the use of handheld diagnostic devices and devices that can assist the vision impaired. So, we're exploring hybrids among all of these types of computing so that what we do can be assisted by a holistic intelligence that is more like ours. And so they're not, our researchers are not merely improving on machine perception. They're in devising new ways to assist human perception. So if we really want to understand data, we have to see it, hear it, or feel it. 
So here we go. Our Curtis R. Prem Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center is our platform for having intelligent, immersive environments. And so we're in the process of developing the Cognitive and Immersive Systems Laboratory at IMPACT where initially this laboratory will focus on creating what we call situations rooms that are interactive environments that automatically respond to their occupants by listening to and watching them. And that will help collaborators working at the same time on different aspects of a larger project to make better decisions, such as all of the physicians involved in a patient's care working together within a cognitive medical diagnostics room. So this all falls under the broad rubric of the Rensselaer idea that is helping biomedical researchers and physicians to find important insights within enormous data sets that we have access to now because of our partnerships. You know, there are 500,000 emergency department visits, 2.6 million outpatient visits, and 170,000 inpatient admissions each year in the Mount Sinai health system, as well as the claims data that we now have access to from 150 million de-identified or anonymized patients that's provided through our partnership with Optum Labs which is a center for research established by Optum, an arm of United Health Group and the Mayo Clinic. And so this trove of data gives Rensselaer and its collaborators the scope to consider even uncommon phenomena and rare diseases and to realize the promise of personalized medicine. Given the slow approval process for new drugs, data tools that can dramatically accelerate our abilities to get targeted new treatments to patients at much large, lower costs using compounds already approved becomes very important. Now I could go on and on, but I won't. Because in the end, it is about enabling physicians to incorporate the insights of other fields into medicine. You know, as many of the healthcare breakthroughs of the future are likely to occur at the nexus of medicine and disciplines that include material science, tissue engineering, molecular and synthetic biology, robotics, and computation. And that's why we have the affiliation with Mount Sinai. So let me now introduce our two distinguished discussants. And you know, originally I was going to question them, but I thought, you know, they're grown ups. <laughs> you know, I think they've been partners. And I want you to hear from them, not just from me. Dr. Dennis Charney is the Ann and Joel Aaron Krantz Dean of the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and President for Academic Affairs of the Mount Sinai Health Center. Dr. Charney was named Dean in 2004, and under his leadership, the Icon School has risen to be among the top 20 institutions in National Institutes of Health funding, and it currently ranks fifth in research funding per faculty member. Dr. Charney is an expert in neurobiology who has made fundamental contributions to the understanding and treatment of mood and anxiety disorders, including the discovery of novel treatments for treatment-resistant depression. He has written more than 700 scientific papers. I thought I had written a lot. <laughs> book chapters and books. In fact, he co-authored the 2012 book entitled Resilience, The Science of Mastering Life's Greatest Challenges based on his research into the psychobiological mechanisms of human resilience to stress. Dr. Charney earned his undergraduate degree at Rutgers College. You didn't know I was a professor at Rutgers University at one point. I've done everything. You know. <laughs> and he received his MD degree from uh, 
of the Pennsylvania State University. He was elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies in 2000. His scientific research has been honored with numerous major awards. In fact, he regularly, regularly is recognized as one of the best doctors in America. Importantly, <laughs> he has improved and even saved many, many lives. And we're delighted and honored to have him here with us. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Dennis. Our second discussant, Dr. Jonathan S. Doyle, has served as the Vice President for Research of Rensselaer since 2012. He is the Howard P. Iserman Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And before he became Vice President, named by me, John was the Director of the Center for Biotechnology and interdisciplinary studies. Professor Dornick's multidisciplinary research group includes chemical engineers, bioengineers, material scientists, biologists, chemists, and microbiologists who together use a quantitative understanding of biological principles to advance bioengineering, nanobiotechnology, drug discovery, and biomanufacturing. Currently, his research focuses on enzyme structure and function at biological material interfaces, including a novel strategy for combating antibiotic-resistant bacteria. He also does work on high-throughput drug and functional materials discovery and large-scale bioprocessing. And here's a factoid for you. Together with Dr. Robert Linhart, our Ann and John H. Broadbent, Jr., class of 59, senior constellation professor of biocatalysis and metabolic engineering. He has developed a scalable, cost-efficient approach to producing bioengineered heparin so that it is re removed from this nexus of the food and medical chain. You know that most heparin is derived from pig intestines today. And heparin is the most widely used, fast-acting, anticoagulant drug worldwide. Now, much of the global supply of heparin, in fact, comes from under-regulated farms and workshops in rural China. And in 2008, there was an adulteration of it that killed 81 people in the United States alone. And just this past week, Professors Linhart and Dordick launched an industry-funded applied research center to accelerate the commercialization of safe synthetic heparin. And we're very proud of their groundbreaking research, which will benefit millions, if not billions, worldwide. Now, Professor Dordick received his undergraduate degree in biochemistry from Brandeis University and his PhD in biochemical engineering from MIT. He was a little bit after me. Now, he has published nearly 350 journal papers, he's not done yet, and holds nearly 40 patents related to his research. Among many other honors and awards, Professor Dordick last month was named a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors, and he just received the highest bioengineering honor from the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, the Food, Pharmaceutical, and Bioengineering Award. So please join me in welcoming my colleague, you know, our great professor, Jonathan Dork. And now I will leave it to them. very much, Dr. Jackson. Uh, as always, she gives such a wonderful presentation and uh, uh, gives you an idea of all the things that are going on at Rensselaer, and it's only a very small part. So uh, uh, it's really tremendous what, uh, what we're doing. 
and what she's leading and uh, where we're going. So let's start here. Okay. Dennis, thanks very much for joining us tonight. Uh, it is in two years we have put together, I think, a, uh, a tremendous linkage between Rensselaer, as the president mentioned, the major re technological research university, and the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, uh, one of the top medical centers uh, in the nation. And what we're going to talk about today is a little bit about what we're doing and where healthcare in America is going and how the linkage between Rensselaer and the Icon School can uh, really drive more of what will improve healthcare for all Americans. So, and by the way, we'll also not only ask Dean Charney questions, but we'll give all of you a chance. And by the way, they're really good at asking questions. Okay. So, <laughs> so let's start out with a uh, uh, sort of a retrospective look at how we got together. Mm -hmm. So when you look at uh, you know what we've done, bringing Rensselaer and Mount Sinai together, what what drove in your case, a major medical school like Mount Sinai to come together uh, with Rensselaer, a major technological research university. Sure. Uh, President Jackson, you know, addressed some of the uh, the issues that brought us together. Uh, Mount, Mount Sinai uh, is a medical school that is more like a biomedical college because we're not affiliated with a major university. Now that that has a lot of advantages. Uh, including being able to be nimble and make decisions very quickly when science uh, dictates it and, and when clinical changes in clinical care models dictate it. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we don't have a department of chemistry, we don't have a department of engineering um, or physics and, and so forth. And we saw that medicine was going to be changing in the 21st century dramatically because of the sequencing of the human genome, uh, because of the application of digital medicine to change the way we practice medicine. And given that we're at the kind of the vanguard of making discoveries that change the lives of patients, we felt we needed a very strong, uh, outstanding uh, university to partner with us to realize the potential of the sequencing of the genome and, and digital medicine and knowledge that would lead to the development of new devices and new medicines that would change the lives of our patients. And given that Rensselaer did not have a strong affiliation with a major medical school and medical center, we thought that together we could do great things. And already in just a little less than two years, terrific things have begun to happen. For example, the, the New York City Economic Development Corporation recognized that something special could happen between Mount Sinai and Rensselaer. And in an unprecedented manner, they called us and said, we'd like to give you some money. <laughs> That's pretty unusual in the current uh, environment. And so because of the affiliation that we had already developed, the New York Economic Development Corporation gave us a $5 million grant to establish a institute of technology at Mount Sinai in collaboration with Rensselaer, whose mission is to discover and develop new devices and new ways uh, to deliver care, including, as President Jackson uh, illustrated, digital medicine. The ability to get information from our patients in the home, their blood pressure, their heart rate, their glucose levels, to anticipate something bad happening that would allow us to intervene early is going to change medicine. <clears throat> the partnership between our two institutions will allow us to discover new apps, new sensors that will change the way we treat patients. And I'll give you a couple of examples that have already happened in two years. We have a collaboration going on between a pediatric neurologist in our system and one of the faculty members at Rensselaer to develop clothing that has sensors in it that will recognize that a seizure is, beginning, is about to occur in patients with pediatric epilepsy. That's pretty amazing. We have another collaboration going on with senior Rensselaer faculty members to develop other kinds of apps 
that would develop uh, a way to measure changes in patients in the home. So th those are just uh, two examples of why this, uh, it, this affiliation is so important. And there are many others, so uh, yeah. Yeah. I can keep going, but I'll stop for the moment. I know. No, that's wonderful. Uh, and that faculty member, by the way, Bulent Yenner, yep. in uh, the Department of Computer Science. And so that shows the, uh, uh, already the linkages outside of the more expected ones, let's say, beyond biology or bioengineering and into now uh, the data science arena. So, okay. so President Obama recently launched a precision or personalized medicine yeah. initiative. So when you look at what Mount Sinai is doing and other medical centers, how is personalized medicine done today? Yeah. And how will technology uh, impact the future development and implementation of personalized medicine? So uh, you probably have a hard time remembering what is precision med medicine versus personalized medicine, because those terms are sometimes used interchangeably, uh, but they're actually a little bit different. Uh, precision medicine is the, an approach that takes a blood sample or a tumor sample from an individual patient and based on the characteristics of that tumor, designs a treatment that is very particular for that individual patient. Uh, for example, at Mount Sinai, we have a te techniques that we're developing in which we take a patient's tumor, we put it into a fly. Believe it or not, a fly can be a model for human cancer. That fly develops the cancer, and because flies have a very short half-life and, and so forth, we put medicine into the fly using all existing possible cancer medicines. This is the repurposing that Pre uh, President Jackson alluded to and can determine in that fly what medicines might work for that patient's individual tumor using drugs that are already available but in unique combinations. And they can go back to that patient and give, the, give them that treatment. This approach was uh, written about in, in Esquire magazine about a year or so ago. It was called Patient Zero, meaning this was a new approach of precision medicine designing treatments for the individual patient. Personalized medicine is more toward a class of disease, you know, that we're learning about breast cancer or colon cancer or lupus and so forth. We're understanding the genetic basis of those diseases, understanding what those genes do, and, and based on that we can develop novel therapeutics for a class of, of diseases. In order to do all this, you need to be good at big data analytics. Having an army of data scientists that are going to help you collate and understand enormous amounts of data. We at Mount Sinai have made major investments in high performance computing, not as much as Watson, but a lot. Uh, we have recruited a We've invested hundreds of millions of dollars in genomics, but we needed a partner that makes their living on genomics and on the, uh, computer science and high performance computing to partner with us to work on the enormous amounts of data that are coming out of the individual patient when, they, when we sequence their human genome, classes of patients with different diseases, and even with our healthcare system which is now one of the largest in the country, where we're gathering enormous amounts of data that we use to run our healthcare system. We needed a partner that was expert in, in statistics, high performance in your computing, and, and knowing where things are gonna be so that we can go there together. Now that's great, in fact, the one area that now it's moving into is truly the predictive analytics. Yeah. So when you bring all that together, not just knowing what something is or putting something into a category, but predicting the progression of a disease, right. uh, simulating uh, that d disease progression, and then being able to develop the therapeutics that come from that. And in fact, uh, there's an interesting story that I'll tell because it came from one of the joint uh, Rensselaer-Sinai uh, 
symposia that we've had. We've had three of them now in a number of different areas, and one of them was actually on big data and healthcare analytics. And it was at Rensselaer last September, and one of your uh, young faculty members, uh, Clissa Matthews, who's an assistant professor in the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine, uh, discussed a very sad case of a man that came to the hospital with anemia and joint pain. And, uh, and then, regardless of what was being done, as unfortunately still happens, he declined, uh, went into the intensive care unit, and, uh, and died 26 days later. Uh, there was still no diagnosis, uh, no clarity as to whether it was an infectious disease or some non-infectious cause. And so when that was being discussed, just that, that analysis, one of our faculty, Deborah McGinnis, who also is in computer science, and a tetherless world constellation professor, uh, who does a lot of work in the semantic uh, technologies, was riveted by that, that uh, um, example uh, and wanted to find out how could she play a greater role in doing this. And now they're collaborating. She and, and Clissa are working together so that all this data that's coming, not only from that patient, but many others that have similar kinds of, of uh, medical indications from electronic health records, from claims data, from uh, genomic information and so forth, and being able to put that into some, th some algorithm, and new algorithms are being developed all the time that will end up providing a better prediction as to what happens to that next patient that comes in. I mean, that, that actually gives an example of how, in a, in a sense, uh, our system can be a laboratory you know, for what we, uh, Mount Sinai and, and Rensselaer can do together. We have 17 ICUs you know, that we run. Yeah. You know, so we've got critical care patients in all these ICUs all the time where we're gathering enormous amounts of data. And as uh, you alluded to, the human brain can't handle all that data, so we need computers uh, to help us. We've also decided that we're going to build a new Beth Israel hospital. So we, we took over five other hospitals uh, as part of uh, our merger with uh, the former Continuum Healthcare System. And one is Beth Israel. And we've decided we're going to build a new Beth Israel. And we're going to use that to build a hospital of the future. We're looking for collaborators on how we're going to design that hospital. What will those ICUs look like? How will we connect the inpatient units to the outpatient facility to patients living at home? So it gives us enormous potential to do things together. And we're also talking with other companies like IBM, Google X, uh, Apple, to do this together. It's, it can be a very exciting venture together. And uh, sure, and we want to be part of that. You're in there. <laughs> As we go down that road, we're going to be right there because you're going to need us. We're there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's talk about something that actually is very near and dear to your heart because okay. it touches on your research. Yeah. Uh, and then when you really start talking about research, you'll, you'll never stop, I understand <laughs> that. But, but uh, so as we talked to the president, talked a little bit about drug repurposing. You brought it yeah. up about we using Drosophila and, and figuring out how to identify the uh, new uses of existing drugs. So many people have actually argued that we, in fact, have all the drugs we need. It's just that we don't know exactly how to use them. Uh, and uh, given the fact that a very large number have already gone through phase one and two clinical trials and been stopped, uh, they can then be used, they're, they're effectively safe, they could then be used in some other indications if yeah. we just knew what to do and how to use them. So in fact, you found something quite interesting. Ketamine, which is a well-known and old drug used as anesthetic, you found was actually potentially useful as a rapidly acting antidepressant. And in fact, that's going through fast track now in phase three, you mentioned. And that could be used for treatment resistant depression, which is obviously an unmet need and one that is critically needed to uh, uh, be used in society. So can you give us a little bit of your thought process of how you actually went about doing that? And, uh, and then in the process, give examples as to where that is just the tip of the iceberg and maybe used in other cases as okay. well. Um, well, serendipity does happen in science. So this is an example of serendipity. Um, back, I was at Yale uh, until 2000, and my colleagues and I at Yale were you know, focusing on discovering new treatments for depression. 
And there was a theory that glutamate, which is a neurotransmitter in the brain, was involved in depression. And so we decided to use ketamine as a probe to see if glutamate function was abnormal in depression. We were not expecting it to be an antidepressant. But what, when we gave ketamine to seriously depressed patients, within four hours, they started telling us that they were better. Now, mo most antidepressant drugs take weeks to months to work. So for, for depressed patients who've been depressed for a very long period of time and had failed other treatments, it was remarkable that they were telling us in four hours that they were uh, remarkably better. I don't know how many of you saw the movie Awakenings. And when these were patients who had developed Parkinson's from a virus in 1918 and 1919. And until L-DOPA was discovered, they were basically frozen. And Awakenings is about giving L-DOPA for the first time, and then all of a sudden these Parkinsonian patients you know, could walk and think again. This was a little bit like what happened with ketamine in, in the first eight right. patients. Nobody believed it. Nobody believed the finding, and nobody attempted to uh, replicate it. Uh, we, years later, about five years later, we replicated it. Then it's been replicated around the world, and uh, we patented it. And uh, we've now developed a collaboration with Johnson & Johnson, and it's, uh, it's in phase three, which is the phase, the critical phase to get a drug approved for uh, depression. So uh, <laughs> hopefully it's going to be approved. So in awakening, though, yeah. That was a fairly, it was a relatively short-lived effect. Yes. And resistance developed and so forth. That's right. uh, what are your thoughts on ketamine? Is that uh, that's a different mechanism? But we we know we can maintain the response. You know, uh, at this point for months, mm -hmm. and we're working to make sure that we can ma maintain it. You know, longer than that because depression is a chronic disease. So there's still work to be done. Sure. You had mentioned about really the hospital of the future. Mm -hmm. So, and you've also briefly mentioned, so did Dr. Jackson, mobile health. So if you really bring those two together, you're starting to link into now what do we do with patients in better surroundings, such as their home. Yeah. And how do you bring the hospital of the future to the home? Yeah. So that's a real challenge, and that's where we need to work together. Because let, let, let's say you have a sensor that is measuring the heart rate in a patient with cardiovascular disease. A doctor in their office can't keep receiving you know, the heart rate data or the EKG data you know, continuously for 24 hours and monitor it. You need an analytic solution so that the data coming out of the EKG at home mm -hmm. gets interpreted by uh, computer algorithms to tell the doctor that something bad is happening. So we need a big data analytic solution. We don't have that yet. We need it for the glucose monitoring, the blood pressure monitoring. Um, there's even a company uh, that is now using the smart, you know, smartphone or smart device to measure what an individual person is doing in terms of their activity level, who they're calling, um, uh, what kinds of activities they're doing to see if it's a precursor to depression. And that will give, give an alert to the psychiatrist that you know, their depressed patient is no longer get, leaving the home, no longer going to the movies, no longer exercising. Right. So you'll read all about the future of digital medicine and the revolution that is going to happen, but it hasn't happened yet because we haven't solved the analytic problems. We, we can do that together. Yes, absolutely. It's wonderful. So as dean, you have to worry about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of them is how do you really educate your students? That's one of the primary missions of being a medical school is to educate physicians. And so when you look at this extraordinarily rapid growth in technology, and data is just one part of it, but there's a lot of other technology that grows. Of course, data is the underpinning of much of it. But what investment is needed, and hence effectively is not being provided as much, by the various sources, by the federal government, by foundations, by donors, yeah. Uh, to, to really en enhance medical education in this country. Are you guys interested in raising money at some point? Well, we might. <laughs> <laughs> That's very important. I'll talk yeah. about that. So, um, <laughs> first, in terms of education, we, uh, we're very innovative in that space. 
in a couple of ways. 25 years ago, Mount Sinai started a humanities and medicine uh, admission program where we admitted, we, we, we offered acceptances to students early who were humanities majors. They could not major in a science and they weren't allowed to take the MCAT. But they were spectacular students. And we wanted to get into our class students that weren't pure pre-med students and they brought a different perspective uh, to medicine. And that turned out to be a very successful program over the 25 years. And we followed those students, how they did in their careers, and they did great because they were spectacular uh, intellectually and, and, and passionate and so forth. A little over a year ago, we changed that program to what we call the FlexMed program. And we changed it because we need to recruit to medicine, not only humanities majors, but students who are majoring in computer science, in physics, and chemistry, and want to go to medical school. And the challenge in the usual pre-med uh, curriculum to apply to med school, it's almost impossible to be a chemistry major or a physics major and computer science major and take all the other requirements. It's impo almost impossible. And study for the, the MCAT, which now takes about six months to study. So we now have what's called a flex med admission program, where we admit early students who are also majoring in computer science, physics, and chemistry, and so forth. They don't have to take the MCAT, and they don't have to take the normal pre-med requirements. We've admitted, just admitted our second class. We get 1,000 applications. We admit, we offer admission to 50 students, and everyone accepts them. So, you know, it's a 5% admit rate, but we get an unbelievable group of students, including some RPI students. That's right. Right. So that's one response to what we see in the future of medicine is going to be. In addition, it is expensive to do research. All the things we're talking about, discovering new medicines, genomics, developing new techniques to sequence the human genome, which has gone from a billion dollars to sequence one genome to less than $1,000 in 10 years. <coughs> All that kind of research costs a lot of money. And the NIH budget has never been worse for biomedical science. Never. And I've been doing this for you know, 30 years. To get a grant from NIH, you've got to be in the top 10% of all the applications that come in. Even lower. Or maybe so even lower. You know, and and you, have to be, you have to submit grants that are not that innovative. Because if they're really out of the box, somebody's going to say it's not going to work and you're not going to get funded. So while we still have to get NIH grants, and you know, we've been doing very well, and actually the collaboration is helping us both do better, you do need philanthropy. I mean, there's just no way around it. And, and so we uh, started, we had a capital campaign at Mount Sinai for a billion dollars. Uh, we ended up raising 1.5 billion. So we did better. We were able to build a new research building uh, similar to uh, yours here in Manhattan, which makes it about four times more expensive <laughs> to build. Uh, you can't recruit great scientists without seed packages, you know, without money to get the best to come. And so you need to rely not only on the federal government, but you need to rely on uh, philanthropy. And philanthropy, you know, in our system, comes from several different sources. One is our alumni. Um, in order to attract the best students, you need to offer them scholarships. Many of our alumni have had scholarships. So we say to them, pay it forward. You know, we gave you a scholarship, help somebody who's a current student or potential student uh, to get a scholarship. And we also get, you know, funds from grateful patients and from our board of trustees and, you know, many different sources. And I can tell you, that no great institution, RPI, Mount Sinai, Harvard, you know, Yale, MIT, you can't be great or maintain greatness without philanthropy. No way around it. That's excellent. Yeah. You know, I think what we should do is actually open this up for some questions because I think, uh, you know, you're going to hear about uh, things that, other things that uh, we can't predict. Uh, but. Uh, I know there's going to be a lot of interest from this audience in uh, what you have to say. So if anyone has a question, we'll be very happy to take it. And 
don't be shy. Yes? Hi, you comment, you spoke about Beth Israel being kind of your, your health care center of the future. Have you thought at all about um, health economics and the type of data that generates and kind of bringing that into the scope of the Beth Israel model? Uh, so a couple of things. One, um, we are building a new, we will be do, building a new hospital there, but we've got a lot of other hospitals. So the, the way we uh, you know, have designed our health system and are integrating it together is uh, that each of our hospitals will have centers of excellence. And it, it's not a hub and spoke model. Mount Sinai Hospital on the Upper East Side is not the hub. Every place is gonna have centers of excellence. Beth Israel, Roosevelt, St. Luke's, New York Pioneer, and so forth, to serve the needs of that community. So it's an integrated system. We think of finances all the time, and, you know, because the, the Affordable Care Act for us, and when I say for us, it means academic, urban medical centers, is bad financially. Not bad in terms of getting people more health care. We believe in that totally. But because the Affordable Care Act results in reduced reimbursement from Medicaid and Medicare. And we still have to take care of a lot of people who are not citizens because they come to our emergency rooms. The Affordable Care Act, if we didn't make any changes, would cost the Mount Sinai healthcare system $500 million over 10 years. So what we are doing, and that's why we're a much larger system, we're doing population health management, which means but because we're bigger, you get savings in terms of uh, certain kinds of infrastructure. We can provide great care at lower cost by having an integrated healthcare system that serves a diverse population like in Manhattan and the other five boroughs. So that's our model going forward. Yes. Uh, as an educational institution, uh, if I go and look back, the greatest scientists who have made enormous contribution to, to mankind, Darwin, Einstein, Newton. As an educational institution, how do you pick a young child who could be the next Darwin, the next Newton, or the next Einstein? So how do we decide on who we how do you me? pick? How do you pick a young child, or a young high school student, or yeah. college stu student, who could be the next Darwin, the next Einstein, oh. next Einstein <laughs> or the next Newton? How do you measure that? Okay. <laughs> Okay, that's not easy, but um, <laughs> what we have learned is um, medicine has traditionally been very traditional. You know, for example, if you look at the, the curriculum in medical schools, which were developed uh, about 100 years ago, based on the Flexner report, that report led to the pre-med requirements that you had to take calculus and chemistry and biology and so forth. It's like a pre-med requirement as if that was fixed and it led to the traditional four-year curriculum. That doesn't make any sense, right? It, the requirements, the typical requirements of the pre-med you know, curriculum shut out people who were innovative and uh, entrepreneurial and were ready to move on very quickly. And that's why our response to that was to eliminate some of the requirements. We're a little bit out there in terms of other <coughs> medical schools, uh, but we've said you don't have to take the MCAT. You better be good in other areas. You gotta demonstrate to us that you are passionate, that you are innovative, that you think out of the box, uh, but we'll take you. We'll take risks on that kind of student. And you see that now in the digital revolution in Silicon Valley. Uh, we, we hired Jeff Hammerbacker on our back he doesn't have a PhD, he doesn't have an MD. He was one of the early Facebook employees that devised the analytic platform for Facebook. So he doesn't need our money, we don't pay him that much. <laughs> <laughs> but he decided that, you know, he developed that platform that looked at the friends on Facebook and decided what ads to run. And he said he didn't want to use his talents to figure out what ads to run and wanted to change medicine. So that's the kind of people we're looking for. And we're not bound by degrees and by rigid requirements that will shut people out. I don't know if we'll get the next Darwin or Einstein, but we'll see. Well, I, I, should, I, should, I, should, I, should, I should add that uh, 
not just medical schools yeah. are changing. So Rensselaer has changed quite a bit. Uh, what we require is very different than what was required when you were a student. Uh, and how we're integrating in very broad concepts, such as immersive environments, even into the classroom. And very <coughs> unusual types of classrooms is something that uh, uh, is very foreign to many of you here today, but will not be to your children. Uh, and, um, and they will become better students, and then you'll have to continue to expand the Flex Med program to all <laughs> Rensselaer We may. And, and by the way, Rensselaer is one of the- We have RPO, we've accepted some RPO. That's right, and we're, I think, one of the <laughs> only places you've uh, put a, uh, an opportunity to fill some slots. Okay. So we're quite excited about that. Um, the question I had was within the last uh, maybe six to nine months, when I interact with hospitals, all that information is now online for me as the patient to see all my results or communicate with my doctors. So this seems with so much going online to patients, have implications to patients as well as to the hospitals as you were talking about the data analysis. What do you see the implications for all the online access by the patients? You know, there are pluses and minuses to that. So, you know, patients can have my chart, for example, where they get access to, you know, their results. And we want to make sure that there's a strong connection between the patient and their doctor in understanding what the data means. Because if the patient doesn't understand that, you know, a test that's a little, a little abnormal uh, doesn't mean much to, you know, to their uh, risk of disease, if they don't understand that, then they're going to get anxious. You know, so in some cases, too much data in which the patient is not informed what it means can just increase anxiety and not make an informed consumer appropriately. So we've got to make sure that the information that the, the patient receives, they understand the implications for it and can act on. In general, the more information, you know, the better. But we've got to take care of that. Another example is, is in terms of the sequencing of the of the genome, where we, we, had a, we have a course at Mount Sinai which is designed to understand what are the implications of knowing the genes that you have and the risk they have to you. And so our students can elect into this course where the students have their, their genome sequenced, which, which means they're going to find out diseases that they're at risk for. And some of those diseases they will find out about we don't have a treatment for it yet. Is that a good thing or a bad thing to find that out? You know, do you want to find out that you're at risk for Alzheimer's disease when we don't yet have a good treatment? So we're trying to understand what is the value of more data to the patient and what are the risks that can make things even more anxiety provoking. Well, I think we'll stop here. Uh, and because uh, we do have to move on, I'm afraid. But thanks very much. You're welcome. So some of you may get a chance to uh, grab Dr. Uh, Charney before he has to disappear, since he does have to run this huge, uh, you know, medical school complex. <laughs> but I think there are a couple of uh, takeaways here. Uh, even I learned a few things. Uh, you know, precision and personalized medicine, and, and really what it means, and the role of technology uh, and new technologies in that. Uh, embedded in this is a terminology that I've heard used uh, more in the biomedical device arena, but it relates to something that Dr. Charney <laughs> talked about, and that is this continuum of care, where you're, you're looking at not only the whole patient, but you're looking at the connectivity of the patient inside the medical complex, but at home intervening, having uh, the ability to monitor, to integrate data, and intervene before uh, an event becomes a real event. A third uh, has to do with the education of physicians of the future and uh, the difference in backgrounds uh, that the medical profession needs and is looking to uh, bring into uh, the practice of medicine. 
and then the fourth, that you cannot lose sight of the physician. And all the tools we talked about are ones that are meant to help in discovery and diagnosis and be to be assistive, both assistive to, to the patients, but especially assistive to the physicians themselves. And then finally, you know, we've always, through the Rensselaer plan, talked about the four Ps. People, because it's always about the people. Programs, programs that can lead to results that make a difference. Platforms, and there are new platforms emerging, particularly with digitized medicine, with the deluge of data, and the, the kind of platforms that we have, that we have developed and make use of, both physical and intellectual. And then the fourth P, partnerships. And what you now, I think, have more of a window on, thanks to this discussion, is the real need for collaboration among people and between and among world-class institutions. Thank you very much, and thank all of you.